Let me see. Let's see. Everyone. Let's see. Share my screen. Okay, and I get distracted by seeing myself. <laughs> so I'm gonna turn off my camera if that's okay. Let's see, or maybe I can actually move it away. There we go, it's probably better. Can you see my screen? Yes. yes. Awesome. All right, so, and actually maybe I can minimize this. There we go. All right, so uh, my name is Ian Utz. I'm a project manager with the California Department of Toxic Substances Control. Um, like Sammy and the, uh, the San Francisco Water Board, um, DTSC, as we call ourselves, we are part of the California Environmental Protection Agency or Cal EPA. Um, so there is some overlap to what um, you know, Sammy was talking about and what I'll talk about today. Um, I understand that I think um, your first like trip, field trip was to uh, uh, Judge John Sutter uh, Park, right? At the um, Oakland Army Base with um, with my colleague, uh, Dr. John Karachewski. So um, maybe some of this will be um, uh, you know, repetitive and um, uh, I hope that uh, I'll share a bunch of new information for you guys today. Um, I work with John on a, a number of projects, but most of my projects are actually in Contra Costa and um, Solano counties. So um, if we have like Oakland specific questions, you know, I have done plenty of work in Oakland um, in my former uh, jobs. And uh, we can look through those sites on EnviroStore if we have time. Um, but um, the general uh, topics that I wanted to discuss today were, I actually wanted to kind of meet you folks where you're at and, and hear what you know about DTSC and um, the cleanup process for um, contaminated properties in California. Um, I'll give a little bit of an overview um, based on what you folks know and don't know. Um, I'll talk about a project example that I manage and then if we have time, we'll go through some of these other things like EnviroStore, which is um, a public database, kind of like GeoTracker that uh, Sammy was mentioning before, a database where you can find as the public, you know, kind of look over our shoulders and, and, and see where, um, you know, look at public records and see how these cleanup pro projects um, are moving along. Um, so with that, I actually wanted to start with a couple minutes of questions um, and actually, from you folks what you um you know maybe questions you might want me to address during my um little talk um these are some questions that i figured would be helpful um you know what do you folks know about dtsc have you ever worked with dtsc before um you know do you know of any nearby cleanup sites i'd love to hear of, of some of the names of cleanup sites that you're aware of near you um and do you know how you can get involved with our cleanup pro uh, process because if you don't you know that's that's what i'm here to discuss today so I will open it up for a couple minutes. Has anyone ever worked with DTSC before? Let's see if I can do this. So no one's worked with DTSC before. Has is, is anyone familiar with any cleanup projects that are in their area? Anyone ever heard of like Hunter's Point or Zeneca or? No, you have your hand up. Do you want to just? Hannah. Oh, and I actually can't see the chat bar anymore. Let me open this up. Oh, my hand, I, I forgot to take it back down, but no, I haven't worked with DTSC. I'm interested in working more with DTSC because of a report uh, about the toxins and the climbins where they said it, you know, it, it's, it's not affecting anyone, but it is in the groundwater. So, um, you know, I think that, you know, there needs to be more research with that. And I'd like to find out if there, there has been more research. Are you guys planning to do more research? Um, I don't know if that this is the time to ask that question before your presentation, but I definitely would like to follow up with you on that. Sure, yeah, I'm, I'm not the project manager for that, but, and I actually think that the, um, I'm trying to remember if the water board DTSC is the lead, but um, uh, I would be, I would love to talk about that, that site. And we can actually look at their, their EnviroStore pro, uh, uh, website together and, and see um, you know, what's available to the public. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Anyone else familiar with, with cleanup pro projects in their neighborhood? Yeah, 
I, I, this is Phoenix. I've actually worked on the McClymans issue. So that's the, the, the sort of the introduction to me, the DTSC. Um, okay. And talk to the program manager there about it. Okay. Probably that was probably Cheryl Powell at the time, or maybe Tom Lanfar. Uh, yeah, I think it might have been Cheryl Powell. Okay. Okay, Bayview Hunters Point. Okay, absolutely. Right, so um, so um, I'm gonna go through. Let me. I'm actually not very good at Zoom, to be quite honest. <laughs> we usually use Teams. All right, so let me do, do, do present. Um, and uh, let me time myself here. And feel free to um, to jump in verbally because I can't see the chat when I'm at time. So um, so. DTSC, is, we're a state agency and our jurisdiction, so Sammy was mentioning that the water board jurisdiction is over water quality and DTSC is, um, was formed um, to address specifically hazardous substances and hazardous wastes. So, and we, you know, when in um, kind of the scientific or the academic community, you'll hear about like cradle to grave, we say um, uh, use of those chemicals. And that's kind of how our program, our, our agency deals with these chemicals. We deal with them from the time that they're manufactured and they're put into products to the time that maybe they are released into the environment. Um, and so I actually pulled up some stats because um, I was curious before this presentation. We have DTSC 13,000 cleanup sites on our EnviroStore database. 10% of them, or about 1,300, are active cleanup sites throughout the state of California. Um, and there are 40,000 chemicals, about 40,000 chemicals used in commerce, many of which are known to be harmful or to contribute to you know, harm in people and the environment. And um, so in DTSC, we're about 1,000 people, only a third of which you know, is working uh, a third of whom are working on these cleanup pro uh, projects. But in general, our, our, our programs um, ensure that the chemicals that are unsafe, um, that they're no longer included in products that are sold in California, um, that facilities that are making these chemicals or um, that are using these chemicals, that they're using them in a safe way, they're not ending up in the environment. And that if they are ending up in the environment, and this is kind of where my job comes in, if they are in the environment, how do you clean it up? And so, um, cleanup in, is needed when um, these chemicals, these toxics end up in the soil, in the water. So not just the groundwater, um, but the soil, the air we breathe, or even in, the, um, even in the wildlife and organisms above concentrations that we think um, based on the science uh, are known to cause you know, health is issues, cancer or non-cancer issues. So, um, we usually discovered these sites through sampling. Um, so sometimes someone gives us a tip, like we saw, you know, oh, I saw so-and-so uh, company, you know, dump drums of oil or, you know, this chemical over there, and we'll investigate that. Sometimes they're found during um, real estate transactions. So a lot of, you know, the development that happens in the Bay Area, like for apartment buildings, um, there's a whole industry around sampling uh, soil and groundwater when those buildings are being, before those buildings are built to make sure that the property is not contaminated. So sometimes we'll discover sites that way. And sometimes places like factories, they're simply required to do sampling or, you know, required to uh, report to us as the regulator, you know, the regulator um, on whether their operations are actually resulting in, you know, pollution to the environment. Once they end up, these sites end up in our program, um, someone like me gets assigned a project manager and they have to follow a set process that the law, state law and federal law says they have to follow. And so um, I'm gonna skip ahead for one sec. The process looks like this, where you discover a site and then you sample it, you investigate it. Um, you know, you take samples of all these environmental media, you determine whether um, there has been a release of these chemicals to the environment and whether those concentrations um, uh, require cleanup. Um, in some cases, if it's like metals, for example, and there's, and, uh, you know, metals concentrations might be uh, relatively high in, you know, certain background soils in this area, 
then it might not require cleanup. For other things like um, Sammy was mentioning earlier, you know, issues where there's vapor intrusion, um, that is, you know, those are sites that do require cleanup typically. So um, once we have assessed all the options, you know, the engineering options, then we'll decide on a, a, a technology to clean it up and then we'll progress through the cleanup. And in some cases, the operation and maintenance of a cleanup technology for forever or, um, you know, as long as it needs to, to be operated. During this process, um, a lot of different stakeholders can be involved in the cleanup. And that's one of the takeaways I hope that, you know, you'll have from this talk today, which is, um, everyone in the community should feel empowered to be involved in our cleanup projects at DTSC. Um, and um, so sometimes that's, you know, that's always other agencies. It's always the community that is around a project. Maybe it's like a quarter of a mile or half a mile around a project, depending on community interest or the type of cleanup that's happening. Um, sometimes even the federal government gets involved. but. The general rule of thumb is that folks that cause the contamination are the ones who are responsible for cleaning it up. The goal is to have is to not have the state or the people paying for the cleanup of, of the polluters. Um, so one of my jobs is to work with those polluters um, to ensure that they're, the cleanup is happening um, safely and correctly and on time. So um, the cleanup process. So once you have a site that, you know, we've identified as contaminated. So for example, you know, um, Bayview, you know, Hunter's Point, its former um, uh, naval base, right? Or Mare Island, a former naval base, or Zeneca, which is a site I'll talk about in a second. One of my sites, it's a former chemical manufacturing facility. Once you find out that, you know, you've identified the contamination, the types of chemicals, where they're at, um, what sort of risks to human health there are, what kind of receptors we say there are, people who could be at, at risk of you know, coming into contact. Then you have to um, evaluate all the options according to a set list uh, that I have here on the screen. So all of the cleanup options, if we have a decision, right, on, what, on how to clean it up. So Sammy was mentioning earlier, like sometimes there's groundwater extraction you know, and um, treatment where you actually pump out the groundwater and you treat it above ground. That's one of the technologies as an example. You have to always, the, at the end of the day, all of our technologies have to meet the first two criteria here, which is protection of human health, the environment, and it has to follow the law. So that's what number two is. It has to follow all the various, you know, air district laws and water board regu you know, regulations and rules. And so after that, you go through a kind of more technical process and you look at these other elements, like how much will it cost? Um, will you actually be treating the chemicals or will you, will you simply be um, digging it up and moving it to another area of California, like a landfill, which presents kind of environmental justice questions about moving contaminants from one place to another. Um, and also another, you know, one of the nine criteria is community acceptance. So part of the cleanup process which I'll talk about in a second, is um, very formal community involvement. So um, there are public comment periods where people have the, the chance to send us um, comments that we have to respond to. Um, there are public notices that get sent in the mail to people around the cleanup site. Um, one of the ways that, um, that the public can get involved is by using our um, database EnviroStore. It looks like this. The website is envirostore.tse.ca.gov. And if you know the name of a site, for example, McClyman's, um, you would type it into um, the search bar here, and click on the name, um, or you can click on view on map. Sometimes for a big site like Hunter's Point, you'll put in Hunter's Point and you'll see a number of sites include that name. So you'll, um, you know, there are all sites that might be within that actual cleanup site, um, multiple pages for that cleanup site. Within our EnviroStore um, database, it looks like this. At the left, this is kind of like the home page for an individual project. These are all the various tabs that are available when you go in and look at our database. Um, so you, you'll have at the bottom, you'll have like a summary of the history of a cleanup site. You'll have the size of the site in acres, um, the, uh, the, um, the chemicals that are found at the site, um, where the chemicals are found, so like soil, groundwater, 
Then in the tabs, you can go through, you can actually sign up for email alerts. That's what I put the yellow star up here in the top right corner, sign up for email alerts. That's one of the ways you can, you can get involved um, and to get email alerts every time a document is uploaded to this profile or a major activity happens. The community involvement tab, um, I'll talk about in a second. And the maps I'll talk about in a second, but these other ones, site, facility docs, sub areas, these are where you can find documents. This is where you can find a map uh, or a description of the various parts. Uh, you know, sometimes cleanup sites are really big and they'll have different areas within it and you'll have a description of those. Um, and Calendar screen, I hopefully have a chance to talk in a second as well. Um, you'll have a score on these cleanup sites, which is, um, have you folks heard about EnviroScreen yet? Bring the, the training. Look at the chat here. Is anyone? Um, no, I didn't talk about it. Okay, so no one's heard of, um, it's not just No, today, we've heard but, of it before. Oh, okay. okay. Awesome. So this is a really good tool for folks to use um, just in general, not just for cleanup projects, but also in terms of looking at environmental justice throughout California um, based on where you are. So I'll go through this. Come on. So when you look at the map tab, um, it'll pop up. This is one of the, this is my major site that I manage in the city of Richmond, the Zeneca cleanup site, former man, uh, chemical manufacturing facility. Click on the maps tab. It'll show you where the site is you know, on like Google maps. And if you click on one of these maps, it'll actually open up something that I really recommend you folks look at, um, which is an actual map of the cleanup sites overseen by DTSC. And actually you can click on View tracker and open up the waterboard sites on one map as well. And it'll show you based on the color here at the left, what type of cleanup site it is. Um, it even shows sites that maybe aren't cleanup sites yet, but they're permitted. So they're like operating, you know, factories, that sort of thing. It's very, very helpful to see what cleanups are in your area, near your home, near your workplace. Um, and you can actually download this data and um, do research with this, with these data, you know, that are publicly available. Um, if folks are like familiar with GIS um, and software like that. Um, community involvement tab has a link to all of the like public notices and kind of more public oriented documents in the cleanup process. I've included a work notice here um, for my site which was, it's recent, it's for actually ongoing work at my cleanup site. There's a excavation happening, there's digging work. So we sent this work notice to all the surrounding you know, businesses and some of the, re you know, the residential community that's near the site to inform them that there were gonna be trucks and that um, you know, the work was gonna be happening on site and what we're doing to make sure that the air quality is not affected, that the traffic's not affected. Um, how long it will take, that sort of thing. So the community involvement tab is also really important. If you have a site that you want to stay up to date on uh, and you don't necessarily need to look at those big technical reports, you just need to look at like major updates to the community. Um, so, and as an example, I wanted to give kind of list out all the ways that, you know, public engagement, public involvement is included in our cleanups. For my major cleanup site, Seneca, to give you kind of a, um, an idea of, um, of, of kind of the history of this site. Um, this is, um, of course, this site in Richmond uh, is in an area that has been inhabited for thousands of years, right? And it wasn't until um, the uh, late 1800s that it was developed with a chemical manufacturing facility which then operated all the way until the 2000s. So really long time, especially for California. And it wasn't until the 1960s that, you know, all these environmental regulations came out protecting water quality. It's mostly water board related regulations at the site, you know, preventing fish die offs in the, in the bay right next to the site. Because like many manufacturing local facilities in the bay that were along the shoreline, the history of them is they used to basically just dump chemicals right into the bay, right? So it was in the 60s and the 70s that these laws, in the 80s that these laws started to come out, preventing that from happening. And um, it wasn't until the 1980s that my um, field of cleanup really came about um, and people started to actually sample the soil and the groundwater and, um, and to find, oh, this is a contaminated site, right? The chemical operation, chemical manufacturing operations caused contamination to the soil, to the groundwater. 
to the soil gas, to the surface water next door. And um, DTSC became involved in the 2000s um, when it you know, became the lead cleanup agency for the Seneca site. Since that time, it's been investigated and under cleanup. So it's been you know, several years of cleanup of this site. And it's, you know, it's, it, this is what it looks like today. It's, it's, you know, there are basically no more buildings on the site. It's just basically cleanup happening. Um, and um, so at the left, I've listed all the different ways that this particular site, um, you know, interacts with the community basically in terms of how they can participate. Um, in California for DTSC cleanup sites, if 50 or more people sign a petition in the community to form a community advisory group, we are mandated by state law to consult with that community advisory group. It's basically like an oversight group at the neighborhood level. Um, it includes, you know, local uh, representatives of, of, the, of the neighborhood, people who live there, um, local businesses, other public agencies. And I actually have, you know, I, as a pod project manager, speak with these folks on a monthly basis in meetings or, or some, you know, um, every other month. I interact with them by email. So there's a formal involvement of communities that, uh, you know, basically vote to like be more involved. Um, it's usually for larger cleanup projects that that happens. Every cleanup project has to have a public participation plan, which means we have to take a survey of the community to find out what languages they speak and how involved they want to be, how they prefer to be communicated with, like by mail or by phone or by you know, in-person meetings. We send public notices in the mail. So you saw an example of public notice I just showed earlier. They're basically mailers you'll get in the mail um, saying, hey, this is going on, or hey, you know, there's a public comment period coming up. Would you like to send us public comments on this decision we're about to make? And make your voice heard. We have public participation specialists, people actually assigned to um, uh, um, to, uh, to interface with the community and basically translate the scientific work that's going on, the engineering work to plain language um, so that the surrounding neighborhood can understand really what's happening. And then there's of course the, the environment store database that I, I told you about. Um, our policy as, a, as an agency for cleanup sites is to engage, uh, is to consult with uh, tribal communities on all of our cleanups. And so for all of my cleanup projects, basically we, I assign, uh, we get someone assigned a tribal affairs coordinator who then sends a letter to all, all of the, the um, tribal communities that have a historical relationship with the area or who have, might have uh, resources in this area. Um, and I basically ask, would you like to be involved in the cleanup? And so that's another way that communities that might not have historically been involved in cleanup um, are now involved. And for some of my sites, the answer has been, yes, we would like to be involved. We would like to see the sampling work happen, or we would simply like to be on the mailing list, that sort of thing. Um, so that's really important around shoreline communities in the Bay where in you know, Richmond, for example, there were several sacred sites, right? Um, shell mounds that um, were you know, basically destroyed during the industrial development in this earlier period. So um, that's that. Does anyone have any questions about these elements here before I move on? Matt, yeah, I have one quick question. Just to um, clarify, you said for the community advisor group, you only need 50 community signatures to start one of those? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Correct. So you can um, circulate a petition and then present it to DTSC, and then, um, and that's how a community advisory group gets formed. Thank you. Yeah, question. All right, so I'm gonna move on to the next slide. So this is the website. Um, I think I will come back to this in a second if I have some time at the end, maybe as part of the Q&A. Um, one of the, what I was I was mentioning I was gonna come back to this score here. All of our cleanup sites on our the, um, the, the home page. Um, get a sip of water. They have a score, which is basically represents the percentile in versus other census tracts in the state of California. For um, for basically their environmental burden, and there's a whole technical process. And a act, we actually, as a state, just released a new version of this EnviroScreen 4.0, which I very much um, 
uh, suggest you folks look up, but basically it takes all this data that you can see at the left, which is basically all of the major databases that we collect data on in terms of pollution in a community for, for each census tract, you know, um, and then you multiply those percentiles by um, basically vulnerabilities. So maybe, um, you know, pre-existing health conditions um, uh, that already show you that there are environmental impacts and socioeconomic factors that um, amplify those environmental impacts and you get this score. And we use this score um, as DTSC to basically prioritize very limited resources that we have as an agency, focus on sites that are um, in, um, the legal term is basically disadvantaged communities. That's the, the top 25% of the scores, meaning the, you know, 75% uh, of the scores are equal to or less than that area. So you're really in the top uh, area of the pollution burden in California. That's where we want to focus our um, our most urgent attention and our resources. And you can find actually that information for a given cleanup project on the EnviroStore page. So you can see some of the score data. First, uh, the um, EnviroStore database, it's still linked to 3.0, it's still very useful. I think they're going to update it to the 4.0 that came out recently, which includes new things like you can see here, linguistic isolation, which I don't think was included in 3.0. It's the sort of thing that tells you, you know, uh, for households in the community, um, uh, how basically, how, how able are those households um, to uh, be able to communicate in English with our cleanup projects. Um, so this is actually what the map that comes out of Enviro screen looks like, and you know, and then you can see the colors at right showing the you know the higher scores in you know orange or yellow, and the lower scores in green. It tells us what we probably all already know in our hearts and you know from experience, um, and it puts it in a form that allows decision makers like me and you know public policy makers unlike me, um, to and focus resources and prioritize. And um, this is actually this list last week, they, um, the state came out proposing a new list based on the new data of communities, in, uh, as I said, disadvantaged communities, which are basically eligible based on that designation for grants and money for communities to um, put into use, uh, to, again, prioritize the state's resources. Another way that we involve the communities, I'm going to look at the time here, um, is uh, we have, like I said earlier, a tribal consultation policy, and um, which, if you're interested in um, in in this burgeoning field of of um, policy in, in California, I definitely recommend you look at this. I really, it's a it's a very helpful policy that we have. Um, it's causing a lot of changes in our. Um, in the way our cleanup projects um, start off. And um, basically, like I said earlier, it's that we start the beginning of as early as we can in the cleanup process, asking the tribal communities, um, would you like to be involved? And if so, how? And typically it, it, uh, tribal partners like to be involved with what we call ground disturbing work. So if you're digging, um, if you're taking you know, samples, if you're gonna be um, treating, you know, you're actually uh, cleaning up the site. Sometimes, you know, you're going to disturb the site. You might disturb the surrounding, uh, uh, the surrounding like habitat, right? So, um, start early on these projects. That's basically this policy. Another way, another thing that's um, a burgeoning field in DTSC is um, the way that we deal with um, climate change. And in the Bay Area at Shoreline sites, the big question right now is um, what was mentioned earlier, right, is sea level rise. Um, so uh, this is an area that DTSC has uh, become very involved with in the last couple of years in terms of engaging with the, uh, the uh, local academic community and um, also other agencies who are frankly the experts on sea level rise, right? Um, the Bay Conservation Development Commission, um, Federal NOAA, National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, and the Oceans Protection Council, which is a state agency. These are folks who are literally forming these maps, right, and modeling like what are the possible predictions for sea level rise uh, in California. 
we as a as DTSC, we use that those experts, the predictions from those experts as part of the cleanup process to figure out, well, does the cleanup decision that we make, you know, how should that be modified to account for future sea level rise? Do we need, and I actually include a screenshot here, one of the engineering designs for my site, Zeneca, that basically changed the design of the project um, to a to accommodate for future sea level rise. Basically, um, you know, what physically will you do differently to prepare for sea level rise or monitor for sea level rise? So typically our cleanup projects will involve evaluation of future water rise, you know, along the shoreline um, at the decision phase when we decide on the remedy and also in the design phase of the remedy um, when we actually have engineers basically drawing up, you know, what is it going to look like physically on the ground? Um, one of the ways that you can get, you folks can get involved. Um, I think we were, we were talking earlier about, um, you know, how, how can folks who are working during the day, um, you know, get involved with our decision-making process. At a state level, if you want to see, if you want to speak with the higher ups, you know, my boss's boss's boss, um, you can attend our quarterly public meetings. Um, this is the website that you can follow. And it, I think these meetings run typically about 5.30 to like, I think 8.30 or later. Um, that's one way. But I know that for my, for public meetings at the cleanup projects that I manage, those public meetings are always uh, after you know, working hours. Um, the CAG meetings, the community advisory group meetings, those are always planned, you know, um, on weekdays, but uh, after working hours, you know, after 5 p.m., typically like 7 p.m. or later. Um, a lot of our public meetings are, mostly all of our public meetings at this point are online, which I think makes things uh, uh, more accessible for more people. Um, that said, we do also meet in person every once in a while, especially for these big cleanup sites. I've done site visits in person with, this, with the community advisory group. I think it's important to physically meet people in person. Um, if you have regulatory questions, I've included some contact information here, which I think we'll send these slides out and you can get these. Um, if you have complaints, there's, we also have a complaint contact, you know, just like um, Sam was mentioning earlier, we have a number you can call if there's a, if you, have, you know, suspect there's a release. Um, and like Sammy, I would like to know, you know, how do you feel that you can be, um, uh, you as the community and your neighbors can be better involved in the cleanup? And what is your vision for cleanup in the Bay Area? So I will stop there. And um, I can also discuss vapor intrusion. I can also discuss PFOS um, and more kind of more specific scientific stuff. Um, I'm a scientist and I manage scientists, engineers, and lawyers as part of this cleanup project. Um, so if you can ask me anything about these cleanups, I'll mute myself for a sec. Hi, Ian, this is Hannah. Can you hear me? Okay, cool. Um, so can you talk more about the, um, what is it? The uh, vapor intrusion? I wanna know a little bit more about that. Sure, let me look up. I'm gonna actually just show you because I think it's helpfully more visual. It it's more, okay. it's helpful mm -hmm. to be more visual on this. So vapor okay. intrusion, uh, vapor intrusion. Uh, yeah, let's, see, let's get some images and show you. So um, this kind of image, we call it conceptual site model. Let's see, this is a good picture maybe. Um, yeah, maybe this is a good, this is a good picture. Can you see this picture? Not yet. Showing your slides. Still seeing the power. Oh, it's on the slides. Oh, it's on um, PowerPoint. Okay. New share screen. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Let's see if I can find. Can you see this picture now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So vapor intrusion. So there are many ways that we can come into contact with contaminants in the environment, right? You can, um, you know, the typical example that we talk about. Um, is like a drum that gets tipped over, right? And then you have liquid contaminants that, that seep into the soil 
and then it contaminates the soil. We call that a source area, right? It's the source of the contamination at that point. And the soil can then leach into the groundwater. And you can basically have vapor intrusion from the contaminants that are in the soil. We call it the soil matrix or this, you know, uh, the unsaturated zone, the areas where there's not very much water, right? The kind of first few feet typically of the, you know, when you start digging underground, that can be contaminated or also the groundwater, which Sam was mentioning earlier, that can be contaminated. And um, that contamination, if it's a, a volatile chemical, if it's a chemical that, um, I mean, for lack of a bit, for like a plain language term would be maybe like evaporate or like it volatilizes, right? It vaporizes into a gas form. Um, volatile organic compounds like dry cleaning fluids, or um, I mean, usually they're solvents. They're things that you use to, uh, that you, you want to be volatile. It's, it's part of the characteristic of the chemical that the reason why they made it, right? The smell from sometimes your furniture, from new furniture or from a new car, that's usually from volatile organic compounds, VOCs. Those are the sorts of chemicals that if they end up in the environment, can cause vapor intrusion. And vapor intrusion is, is what we call one of the exposure pathways. It's one of the ways that people can get into contact with chemicals when they're in the environment. It can basically, uh, in its gas form, move up from the soil or the groundwater in through what we call preferential pathways, like cracks in your um, pipes or cracks in basements. We don't have many basements in California, but um, you know, basements are one area. Cracks in your foundation um, can collect beneath a building and then seep into indoor air where it, it can be breathed by people indoors. So the reason it's called vapor intrusion is because it's a vapor that is intruding into a building. That is, that is, the, um, that is the basic explanation. Does that answer your question? It does, and it's really yeah. scary. It is. I mean, I think um, what's interesting about this industry, well, there are a lot of interesting things about this industry. Um, vapor, Sammy was mentioning earlier, vapor intrusion is like um, one of the main exposure pathways we focus on today. And what this industry is relatively new, right? Many folks who are on this call, right, I'm sure several of you are born before 1980, which is when these laws that, that dictate how we do this cleanup that's when they came about so it's a relatively new industry a oh, new field okay and things like vapor intrusion we learn about through doing science just kind of like how you see science going on and we learn new things about coronavirus every day it's the same thing is happening with these chemicals is mm -hmm. um, we find out new things about the ways we can come into contact with chemicals and vapor intrusion is one of those things that in the last 10 15 years we or really 15 20 years we really um Focus, learn to focus on because um, it's not just from drinking, uh, you know, contaminated groundwater, which is very unlikely in, in, in the Bay Area, right? Most of our, our water sources come from pressurized pipes that Ben will talk about, you know, it's, or, or even from coming into contact with contaminated surface water. It's a lot of the times it's from vapor intrusion. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Good question. Um, I see, let's see, I see a question about um, a form of bioremediation called microremediation with mushrooms. Um, I also see, okay, so um, yeah, so um, Adam asked about a form of uh, what we call bioremediation, which is when you use um, organisms like plants or he's mentioning mushrooms that are, um, that are used to basically eat up the contaminants. Usually they're things like um, usually they're more, or, they're, um, they're organic things or usually they're actually uh, metals. A lot of plants will, will, are able to eat up metals and then you can actually harvest those plants and, and dispose of them. And that's a form of bioremediation. I personally have never worked with microremediation at my projects. I think conditions have to be very, to be just right for a lot of biology to be used in the cleanup process. And it's a very new field. And um, typically, you know, I was, I was showing you earlier all these different um, things that we have to consider when we're choosing a remedy, you know? And one of them is short-term effectiveness. How quickly can you remove chemical from the environment? And sometimes biology is slow. So, sometimes, so I think oftentimes it gets um, uh, screened out as an option when we evaluate cleanup projects. So I hope that answers your question. Does anyone have any other questions about this? 
comments about your the cleanups in your area. Maybe I can show you the um, McClymans on Embarrassed Store, and then we can move on. I think then we're at 11.30, yes. and I'll move on to Ben. Okay. In, in my dealing with the McClymans issue, like what I found is that like the DTSE did a study of what was affecting the school, but mm -hmm. it seemed obvious from what they found that the, that the contaminant was in the greater community, but they didn't test the greater, the outside community because there was basically no funding for it because the OUSD was funding the McClymans testing and nobody was funding the outside testing. Is there a way for the community to kind of force DTSE to, to do more investigation on that or? Is there a way for DT, um, the, that's a good question. Basically, how can you, how can the community focus DTSC's efforts um, when basically they feel that, you know, not enough work is being done um, around a cleanup site, you know, offsite, this would be an, so yeah, I, that's a really good point. I am, um, I think that, um, For this area, I think that the con the so this is an example of a fact sheet. I'll get back to that in one second, but I want to show you the Enviro store and I can see the updates on what's going on and show you on a map where I think what you're talking about, Phoenix. Um, this is an example of a fact sheet that's produced for this. And um, um, the outcome of this study that you're talking about, it looks like um, that uh, there was basically no evidence of the vapor. Um, intrusion happening in the indoor air. So I think they've had low levels of the these VOCs in the groundwater. And they found based on sampling the indoor air um, that in the, it looks like the drinking water that there was no evidence of impacts to those sources. But your question is about offsite property. So here's, I'm going back to the page. You can see here, you know, the project manager is Tom Lanfar. It's still active, that's the status. And I can open up the map, and see the other sites in this area and um, talk about what you were asking about. So here are the sites. So here is, can you folks see this map? Mm -hmm. So uh, you can see all of the various cleanup sites in this area, right, West Oakland. And I think the issue that was brought up to the community is um, that the high school might not have been that source, you know, going back to this, move this around, going back to this picture here, uh, this might not have, you know, I think the, the idea was that this hadn't happened at the high school. This had happened. The groundwater moved beneath the high school, and that's where, where it was detected, right? Well, I thought, Ian, that there were some, like, me uh, metal or, or large structures built underneath as storage or something. I don't know if it's the Port Caltrans or who, but that is what's causing the, the, the tam contamination. And I know they can't just like go in there and dig up everything and the houses and everything and take those. I don't know where the contaminant, the, the containers are located, but um, you know, it, it, the, the fact is they're there and they are causing the problem. Um, in addition yeah. to the um, dry cleaners and, and other, you know, the other businesses that were around there. So, I mean, no one is really talking about those containers and based, you know, and I, I, I'd be interested more in an approach of remediation at this point to kind of like, like you said earlier, what did you say? Treating the chemicals, you know, yes. yeah, that are coming from all the, you know, the, the, the toxins. Cause I think at this point that would be like the, 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 um, the immediate action um, to just lower the levels. Um, and then from there we can, you know, look into more long-term or um, even more drastic uh, uh, cleanup uh, activities. But yeah, that's what I, uh, you know, I, I, in conversation, that's what I heard at some of these meetings. You bring up a good point. Yeah, a lot of the time, so I think like underground storage tanks, I think that might've been one of the, I think that was brought up at McClyman's, right? There was like a maintenance area and they had an underground storage tank. And when they removed the storage tank, that's when they sampled and discovered the VOCs, right? And mm -hmm. another area, another- Oh, they removed that, the storage tank? I, well, I don't know. I'm, I'm just saying, um, I think I remember hearing about an underground storage tank, right? Okay, that, okay. What, that, that's how they discovered um, the impacts. I, that's not, I, I don't know if that's true, but, um, but it's a, one of many uh, common ways that you find the contamination is by investigating leaking underground storage tanks or storage tanks when you remove them. Yeah. Another way is, you know, utility corridors. Um, 
our sewer lines and our water lines are backfilled with really, uh, we call it coarse grained materials. So it makes it easier for contaminants sometimes to move through using those sewer lines. Mm -hmm. um, Phoenix asked a good question though, which is, um, you know, there are other cleanup sites in the area here. You see like this is an active cleanup site, metal finishing um, site. Um, uh, this one, it looks like this was, this is a dry cleaner. This is the sort of place that, that uses those VOCs that might be found beneath McClyman's. Um, yeah. So these are the sites that, to answer your question, Phoenix, you get involved with the sites where um, with further evaluation based on the science, you say, yes, the chemical concentrations are high, uh, high enough that it warrants cleanup or poses a, a risk to public health. And that's where the community would want to get engaged is, um, hey, look, we want to be more involved in this cleanup, make sure it's happening in a timely manner and that we want to have a voice in the cleanup. It's at those places where it's gone, you know, it has, every site has to go through this, um, this process. And um, from a climate, the, the process might end here where you end at investigation and then there's no cleanup because the levels, like you didn't find it in indoor air, you didn't find it, you know, at levels that require cleanup. You might have those offsite areas that you're worried about. Other sites might go through this process and say, yep, it requires cleanup. And that's where you wanna be involved as a community through all of these ways that I was listing out here. Does that answer your question? Mm, I'm not sure if it answers my question because I, I guess I, I guess the, the um the the testing has happened just on okay. the campus site, but if it if it is a, a chemical that's migrated, then it's possible that it's getting into the home. Yes, um, surrounding I'm the community. Concerned because I had transferred and um. I just want to like I, I'm just wondering like what re, re, redress do those people have or can or what ability do we have to test like the homes around the community because we have had them in their anecdotal um, reports of people getting cancers in the community uh, you know so we haven't done a health survey to see like what what the real rates are but mm. you know we've heard enough people say that they're you know that that you know, high school students or people who living in the community have gotten cancer, that it's concerning that possibly these chemicals have migrated into their households and like you said, vaporized into their, into their homes. Yeah. I, I, uh, Ian? Yes. So it just to piggyback off of Phoenix, I'm just trying to figure out, you know, since there have been um, reports about, you know, the cancers and sicknesses of the kids and people in the community, specifically a lot of, I think it was like the football players who play in the field um, of McClyman's. Um, where have those complaints gone? I'm just trying to figure out where I could find those complaints. Did they go to you all at the, the DC, the D, DTSC? Did they go to the health department? Um, who did they go to? Well, I don't, I don't know for this project, right? Um, but, and I don't know actually, who, you know, who they made the complaints to, but um, I know that, you know, there were several public meetings, right? And um, any sort of transcripts for those public meetings um, would be publicly available. They would be part of the project record. Um, and, um, but you're asking like who responds to those complaints, right? Is that what you're asking? Well, yeah, I mean, I've been to a, a public meeting um, surrounding it and I'm gonna tell you, nobody was even taking minutes. So I don't really believe in like, you know, a, a public meeting all the time. You mm -hmm. know, we had a town hall at one of the churches here and, you know, everybody was talking about it and I looked around and nobody was taking minutes. And I was like, wow, this is a moot, you know, activity here. We're just talking about it. And like a lot of things, you know, they can say, oh, we're having a public town hall meeting about this. Okay, what did he do? So, you know, there's no follow-up, there's no next steps. Oh, community had a chance to express what was going on, you know, and so and this is a really serious issue. It's not like, okay, I'm tired of the, you know, pollution on the, you know, at the, on a sidewalk of such and such. No, this is like, you know, people dying and people getting sick. And at the meeting that I went to, no one was taking minutes, you know, and it, it's just like, so I, I don't know, but I'm just trying to, figure, that's why I was asking, is there anywhere that people go? Is it the Department of Public Health? Is it, I, I don't know where, you know, the, the, the reports went for the, the illnesses that, um, that came up from uh, McClyman's. Yeah, it's a good question. I think, um, I, unfortunately, you know, I'm not the project manager for that site, so I, I can't say, but 
Um, I know, you know, from, from personal experience, this is one of the most, it is one of the most important parts of a cleanup project is listening to community when they tell you um, that they're, um, that they're concerned about all these cleanup sites in their neighborhood and the, and the impact that they feel they might, it might have on their own health. Um, so the answer is, unfortunately, I don't know for this particular site. Who's um, the program manager or project manager? The project manager, it looks like for this site is um, Tom Lanfor. So you, for every cleanup site, you can actually go and click and it'll give, can you see my screen still? Mm -hmm. And you can see it gives contact information. So you can actually email. And then his supervisor is Kim Walsh. And so you can contact them and say, hey, I'd like to learn more information about the status of this project and where these complaints have gone, that sort of thing. Um, what was the supervisor's name? It's here. It's right here. Kimberly Walsh. Tom Lanfar and Kimberly Walsh. Okay. Yeah. And with their email and their phone number. So um, yeah. I think I'm going to have to... Do you want to throw Stop. that Enviro store link in the chat or is it yeah. not accessible without signing in? I'm going to have to think, move on, let Ben um, have his opportunity to speak. 